So this is a history of Afghanistan, and uh, the part that I'm going to read to you today, the episode, uh, is, is something that took place in the 1920s, and at that time this young man named Amonullah had just come to power. He was a uh, radical, social, progressive kind of a guy, and as soon as he became king, uh, he declared uh, the independence of Afghanistan from Britain and made it stick. So then he was a national hero, and he had all kinds of political capital in the bank. And, um, and then the other thing he wanted to do was like drag his country out of this religious traditional past and bring it into the modern age. And he and his, his beautiful uh, wife, Surayo, they went to uh, Europe in 1927. They were the first uh, Afghan royals to go there. And when they came back, they were just like, oh, you know, no, we're not going to stand another moment of Afghanistan being like it's been. We're going to change it overnight. So the project of transforming Afghan society took on a manic urgency. The royal couple were evidently living in a dream. They hosted a ball, for example, at which the guests were expected to dress like courtiers in the court of Louis XVI. Amonullah had built some public parks and declared them no burqa zones. One day, when he encountered a woman in a burqa there, he made her remove it and he set fire to it. She had to go home exposed. That fall, Amonullah let it be known that he was done compromising with his people. The laws listed in his new code would go into effect and would be implemented full force. Beards were outlawed. Native dress, anyone caught wearing a turban and cobble would be fined. Schools, compulsory for girls as well as boys, and the schools would be co-educational. What's more, over a hundred men would be sent to Europe to study at universities, and there would be no religious test, only academic qualification. Ten girls would go abroad as well, only to Turkey and only to study midwifery, but that was merely the beginning. The king invited the leading women of his city to a special audience and told them that if any man tried to take a second wife, he hoped the first wife would shoot him. Amonullah said he would supply the weapon himself. In October, Amonullah gathered some 600 notables of the city and delivered a monumental lecture that stretched over five days. He set up a gallery so that Surayo, his queen, and a selected array of women could attend the lecture as well. The climactic moment came when he told the notables that religion did not require any veil at all for women, none. As he made that declaration, Queen Surayo stood up in the gallery and dramatically ripped off her own light veil, whereupon a number of other women took their courage in both hands and removed their shrouds as well. <clears throat> Meanwhile, there was new trouble north of Kabul. In a district called Kuistan, which means mountain land, a colorful Tajik bandit was making a name for himself. People called him Bache Sakao, or the water carrier's son. A water carrier was the humblest of street vendors, a peddler who sold water out of a goatskin bag. Rudyard Kipling's Gunga Din was a Sakao. The bandit from mountain land was indeed a mountain of a man famed and feared for his strength. Once in Peshawar, a big iron safe was stolen from a house, and the police immediately suspected Sakao. Why? Because who else could carry away something so heavy? Sakao was not a common thug, but a swashbuckling trickster. Many Zorro-like stories circulated about his foiling of the police. Once the cops had him cornered in a house, but he set fire to it and escaped in the smoky confusion. Many saw him as a Robin Hood figure, because he robbed the rich, moneylenders, merchants, and especially government officials, and distributed the money to poor villagers in his home district, including himself. He worked solo at first, but soon accumulated a band, and his band grew into a small army. His popular appeal and his powerful little force transformed him from a highwayman to a political menace, especially since he declared himself staunchly loyal to the Muslim clerics of the land who were fighting the infidel in Kabul. After he sacked a government convoy and made off with a sizable sum, Amonullah had to take him seriously enough to open negotiations with him. The bandit was flattered 
that the king would negotiate with him, and even more flattered when Amonola offered to make him a general. He was ready to sign on the dotted line, except that he couldn't read or write. Meanwhile, a more serious problem had erupted. The powerful Shinwari tribe south of Kabul, of Kabul had set siege to the city of Jalalabad in the late months of 1928, cutting it off from the outside world. They took control of the roads leading in and out of the city, halting shipments of goods between Kabul and Peshawar. Here was the anti Amonullah uprising that had been brewing for so long. The king decided to respond quickly and with overwhelming force, so he sent virtually all his troops south to battle the Shinwari. Then he made a grievous mistake. He telephoned the provincial official in charge of negotiating with Bache Sakao, and the two men had a good laugh about the ignorant highwaymen who thought the king of Afghanistan was going to make him a general. What a fool. Little did the king and his official know the joke was on them. They were talking on a party line, and the ignorant bandit had friends in the telephone office who were letting him listen in on another line. When the phone call ended, the bandit called his troops together and announced that they were going to Kabul. The story to be continued when you buy my book. <laughs>